Hi, everybody. My name is Patricia Scroggs. I'm the director of the Charles B. Rangel International Affairs Program, and welcome to our webinar. Um, first, uh, I want to make sure that everybody can hear. I guess I was going to say, if you can hear, please let us know. But again, if you can't hear, then you probably can't let us know. Uh, so if anybody's experiencing a problem, do let us know. What do you think? Okay, well, let me just go ahead, and again, if I see a problem, I'll be glad to uh, come back to it. So again, my name is Patricia Scroggs. I've been the director of the Wrangell program for about 10 years now. Uh, we're really excited about the program. Um, our fellows have done terrific things uh, in the Foreign Service, and uh, we're really incredibly proud of them. So let me tell you a little bit um, in this one. I want to tell you a little bit about the fellowship itself. I want to tell you about the program elements. Um, the benefits of the program and the obligations, and then I'm going to uh, turn to the um, application process. If you have any questions, please type them in. Uh, Lily Lopez McGee, our program manager, is here with me, and she's going to be answering questions as I ask. Also, um, we'll have a, a question and answer session at the end so that uh, everybody has a chance to uh, ask any question that they want. If there's a question that you prefer to ask us personally, I think Lily and I will both give you our contact information, and we're very happy to answer um, inquiry over the phone. So first, let me tell you about the program itself. The program itself um, is a um, opportunity to promote both excellence and diversity in the Foreign Service. It came about in uh, 2002, as a result of a desire to have a foreign service that was more representative of who we are as a nation. Um, the fellowship has two components. We have the graduate fellowship, which is what we're discussing today, and then we have an undergraduate summer enrichment program in international affairs. Okay, let me talk to you a little bit about the Graduate Fellowship. So the purpose of the Graduate Fellowship is to provide education and professional development assistance for people who want to be Foreign Service officers. That is the point of the Wrangell Fellowship. We really want people who are interested in serving their country as Foreign Service officers. Uh, so if you're thinking as well, I'd really love to have money for graduation, uh, or for grad school, that's fine, but that's not really what this is about. This one is really about um, professional development and, and trying to get into a really wonderful profession. The program itself uh, provides funding for graduate school, about $95,000 over two years for both graduate school and uh, two summer internships. Um, you'll start with an orientation to the program in the Foreign Service. It would that will happen in May of next year. You do a 10-week internship on Capitol Hill. Um, between your first and second year, you'll do a 10-week internship at a U.S. Embassy. Uh, you graduate and you join the Foreign Service. Throughout the entire period, you'll have mentoring for a Foreign Service officer. So let me go through that timing for you one more time. So you're going to apply by September. You're going to know whether or not you're a finalist by the end of October. We're going to interview uh, November 16th and 17th this year. And probably November 18th or 19th, you're going to know whether or not you have the fellowship. You will immediately start with your uh, clearances. Uh, then you'll actually come here to Howard towards the end of May of 2017. Uh, one week of orientation, uh, your overseas, your, I'm sorry, your congressional internship. Then you start your first year of graduate school. Between your first and second year of graduate school, you'll do an overseas internship. Come back, you finish your uh, second year of graduate school. Let's say you graduate in May, you're probably going to end up joining the Foreign Service in late June. Okay, let's get into what the fellowship award is, because this is the part that I'm sure interests you very much. So we say the fellowship uh, is worth up to $95,000 over two years. So how does that work out? Well, there's a couple of different parts of it. First one is tuition. Uh, so we will pay your school directly $21,500 per year toward uh, tuition and mandatory fees. Uh, your university will actually send us a bill 
we will pay that for you directly to them. We will give you a stipend of $16,000. This is for your living expenses. So you can pay for your housing, you can pay for your travel back and forth from school, you can pay for books. Again, we give it to you and you will manage it. We also give $10,000 uh, per year for internships. How that works out is generally your stipend will be about $7,000. And then uh, the amount we pay for your housing and transportation is usually about $3,000. So if you add it up all together, it's about, it's about $95,000. Why do I say up to $95,000 rather than $95,000? That is because let's say uh, you went to, I don't know, you decided to go to a state school that maybe only cost $15,000 a year. Well, we would pay $15,000 a year rather than the $21,500 um, that we give for tuition, but you do not get the rest of that back as extra stipend. So that would be the only reason you wouldn't get $95,000 over the period would be if the cost of your school uh, was less than the $21,500. Now, $95,000 hopefully sounds very good to you, uh, but actually we have another benefit too, which is the fact that we work with graduate programs that provide supplemental financial assistance. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit more later, but this can be a really big deal. If you have a school that's uh, basically matching um, or paying the rest of what we don't pay, I don't know, $26,000 uh, a year, let's say. You know, if you put that over two years, that's about $52,000. So you could actually be getting even more uh, through the program than what we have right now. But anyway, I'll talk about that a little bit more later on. Okay, so we talked about the benefits, and those are great. Money, um, mentoring, um, and you have uh, automatic entry into the Foreign Service. But there are some obligations, and you should know these and take these very seriously too, so that you can think about them. The first one is that you have to be able to get clearances. Those are medical, security, and suitability clearances. As foreign service officers, um, we have a, a very unique um, responsibility. Uh, we represent the United States overseas. We are entrusted with um, uh, top secret infor information, and how we behave reflects upon our entire country. Uh, therefore, standards. Um, uh, on our website, we have some information on security and suitability, and you should look through that. Again, because we work overseas, we sometimes work in difficult places. Um, when that happens, um, we want to know that you remain healthy. So you will have a very thorough medical uh, examination as part of the process. If for some reason you do not uh, get these clearances, you would not be able to stay with the uh, fellowship. Now, you would be able to join it. So when you uh, actually apply for the fellowship, you won't have these uh, clearances. But soon after we select you, we'll begin the process of getting those clearances. The next thing is that while you're in graduate school, you have to have a GPA of 3.2. So you have to maintain it uh, during the time you're in graduate school. The next one is that you have to meet State Department entry requirements. Mostly, uh, that means that you have to be you have to uh, take the Foreign Service um, written test. You are not required to pass it as a Wrangell Fellow, but you are required to take it. You also have to take the Foreign Service oral assessment. Uh, this is usually the second part of the Foreign Service entry procedure. Now, neither of those Eve, uh, will keep you out of the Foreign Service. Uh, however, you do have five years to pass the oral assessment uh, once you join the Foreign Service in order to remain in the Foreign Service. So again, passing the Foreign Service officer test and passing the oral assessment will not keep you out of the Foreign Service. But if you want to remain after five years, you will have to pass your Foreign Service oral assessment. Um, the next important obligation is a five-year service obligation. Uh, when you accept the fellowship, you accept the fact that once you join the Foreign Service, uh, you will give the organization five years. Honestly, that, as I said up front, this is the reason for the fellowship. Um, if you're thinking, wow, you know, the Foreign Service, uh, you know, I don't know. Um, but if it's something you're very enthusiastic about, it's a great, it's a great fellowship. And honestly, I think five years is about right.
Uh, I have to say, when I joined the Foreign Service, I wasn't absolutely positive that would it be that it would be my entire career. Uh, and I thought, wow, I'm going to try five years because five years is basically two uh, two year tours and maybe a year of training. Uh, and so that's a pretty good period to be able to feel whether or not it is the right career for you. So those are your obligations. Um, next. Um, is a look okay so that's basically what it is so what happens um, once you join the program well again I told you we, we start in about the third week of May usually and you come to Washington DC and you're here for a week uh, we will um, house you here at Howard University uh, you'll go through your medical and security clearance uh, sorry your medical clearances while you're here your security should be done before you hopefully before you actually get here you'll start that immediately but you will do your medical clearances we'll also work on uh, different types of professional development activities for example we have a very intensive program in foreign service writing that I think you'll find really useful uh, we'll also to work on things like presentation skills, things that are going to be very helpful to you as FSOs. Uh, we also want you to learn more about um, what you're going to be doing in the Foreign Service. So you get to visit State Department, you get to meet with very senior Foreign Service officers. I think the one thing you realize as a Wrangell Fellow, um, the State Department has a huge investment in you and they're really invested in your success and actually people really love to work with Wrangell Fellows. So you'll get to meet some terrific people and I think you'll feel a lot of support from having people um, that are so excited about your future. Uh, we also, again, because you're going to next step is congressional orientation, we also will will work on some congressional orientation activities so that you're going into your congressional internship with um, knowledge of how Congress um, operates and you know how that's going to matter in your um, in your internship. Okay, so that's the first week. Then throughout the summer, even though you're going to be working on Capitol Hill, we'll see you regularly. So we work very hard during the summer, I tell you that up front. But we also take um, very good care of your time and make sure everything we do is very useful. So we'll see you once or twice a week in the evening and occasionally we'll even do a Saturday and we certainly do social activities all summer. Okay, then you start your congressional internship. The Congressional Internship is uh, one of the things that makes the Wrangell Fellowship, I think, really special. And it's one of the differentiating factors between us and the Pickering program. So uh, the Congressional Internship, uh, you can uh, we do this, you can tell us what you're interested in, but we'll make the arrangements for your internships for you. And you're going to work uh, on Capitol Hill for a member of Congress or perhaps on a committee. So we've had people that have worked in the Senate, um, in the House. Uh, we've worked on Senate Foreign Relations Committee, House uh, Foreign Affairs Committee. We've done the House Ways and Means Committee, uh, Subcommittee on International Trade. We've done um, different types of commissions, like we've, we've had people work on the Human Rights Commission or the China Commission. Uh, so people work in different parts. Um, we have uh, placements both Republican and Democrat. Uh, up on the hill. One of the great things about this is that uh, you have, at any time, we have 30 uh, people up on the hill, which means you guys become the world's best network. Uh, because we have, you know, eyes everywhere, if there's a really interesting hearing on Capitol Hill, one of you is going to know about it and you're going to tell the rest of the group and so everybody will be there. If there's an interesting uh, kind of F after hour thing going on, so maybe there's a reception at the Peruvian Embassy or maybe there is a really good program in the evening, one of you will hear about it and then everybody will know about it, which is uh, a great opportunity too. I always say that there's no such thing as free food anywhere on Capitol Hill where Wrangell Fellows are not there because anytime there's a good reception that has food, one of you knows about it, next thing you know, there are all the Wrangell Fellows. So it's really nice uh, to have a group of people that are sharing this experience with you. Uh, we believe very strongly in the Congressional Internship. Congress has a very important role to play in U.S. foreign policy and it's a role that a lot of people don't understand. So we feel like we're bringing in Wrangell Fellows that have something very special to offer their offices and the State Department as a whole. And I think you'll really enjoy getting to spend the summer up in Capitol Hill. 
the other positive thing about it is that you get to take this experience on Capitol Hill and bring it into your um, first year of graduate school because you've already done your domestic internship the first summer, you're able to do your overseas internship between your first and second year. That means you get to take all that you've learned in your uh, overseas internship and bring that into your second year of graduate school. Um, and so I think that really uh, helps integrate what you're doing in terms of professional development with what you're learning in school. So I think that's a true benefit of it. Graduate school. Um, you can go to any good graduate school in an area of relevance to the Foreign Service. It has to be a two-year graduate program and it has to be at a U.S. institution. So what types of things can you study? Well, certainly you can study international relations, public policy, public administration, business administration, but maybe you're going to get a degree in, I don't know, conflict resolution or Asian studies or economics or um, even political science. So there's a variety of, of things as long as they are relevant. Um, sports medicine is not relevant. Um, the other thing is it has to be a two-year program. So very often we get asked, well, can I do a PhD? Unfortunately, no. Can I do a joint program where maybe I do a joint um, master's in international relations and master's in business administration? That's a three-year program. The answer to that would also be no. You would have to pick one or the other and do it in a two-year program. Um, we only do deferments for one thing, for educational reasons, and that's if you were to get a, a Fulbright uh, fellowship or Fulbright program. So other than that, you would be expected to come in uh, when you're supposed to, and you would be expected to graduate two years later. Um, what else? Okay. Also, I think I mentioned that we have some grad schools that uh, provide additional financial assistance. Um, if you email us, we'll be glad to send you a list of their offers. The actual schools are listed on our program. Uh, we're always working and we'll probably have a couple of couple more. In addition, even if they're not formal partners, very often they will work with us to provide additional financial assistance. Um, so that should be another benefit for you. So let me kind of explain how it works. So again, the reason we say we give $21,500 uh, for your tuition is that way you can tell the school that's exactly how much you're getting. And so it's very clear what the difference is in tuition. And schools are more likely to give tuition assistance to, to fellows. So let's say you would decide to pick Columbia University in New York City. Uh, $21,500 sounds great. Great. And right now, I think tuition and fees are probably about $48,000, $48,000. That leaves about $26,000. Um, usually, for at least two Wrangell Fellows every year, Columbia will provide the rest. So that's worth, what, about another $28,000 a year or $56,000 over two years. That's great. If you decided to go to Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, I think they're doing about $22,000 a year on top of it for Wrangell Fellows. So that's all very positive. I think another thing that's really exciting this year is because we've uh, moved up our application deadline, you will, most of you will actually know whether or not you're going to be a Wrangell Fellow before you put in your applications. Again, you'll know probably by November 19th whether or not you have the fellowship. That means when you're going to these schools, you can actually tell them that you're a Wrangell Fellow. Um, they really like the fellowship for a lot of different reasons. Um, they know that we we pick really great people in a very rigorous process. Uh, we know that they know you're going to be getting <clears throat> some financial assistance, and they know you have jobs when you graduate. These are all wonderful things for graduate schools. So we're hoping this is going to make them even more enthusiastic about your candidacy uh, for uh, different graduate programs. So I think our link with graduate schools is a really special part of the uh, Wrangell Fellowship Program. Okay, so as I mentioned, between your um, first and second year of graduate school, you're going to do an overseas internship. And this internship is fabulous because it really gives you a better idea of, you know, what it's like to both work and live in the Foreign Service. The Foreign Service is so much more than a job. It really is a lifestyle. And so you get a chance to um, see that. Because you are a Wrangell Fellow, um, the embassies know that you're a future colleague. So generally, they treat you very differently. Very often, you will end up, you know, 
basically you know filling in for another foreign service officer during the summer. You get really um, strong substantive work, um, and you get to start your network in the foreign service, which is terrific. Another way it's really beneficial is because um, you don't have to pick up front what career track you want in the foreign service. And of course, the foreign service has uh, five, political, economic, public diplomacy, consular, and management. You have about 18 months after you join the, uh, this program to make that decision. And so if you're unclear what you want, you might try it in your, um, in your overseas internship to really help you make that final decision. And our fellows go all over the place. You can't go anyplace dangerous, but you know they go to Japan, they go to Peru, they go to, um, I'm trying to think, they go to, we have a couple people in South Africa, we have people in Mumbai, <laughs> India, we have people at USOECD um, in, and, in you know, what, Eastern Europe. I have somebody this year who's in, um, Uzbekistan, so some really interesting uh, places. So I think that's a real benefit of the program. Okay, so let's, as I mentioned, so you finished your time uh, in graduate school, you've done extremely well, you've kept your 3.2 up, um, but then it's time to go into the foreign service. So if you graduate in May, you're probably going in in late June. Um, you have, again, by then you have your clearances, uh, again, you do have a five-year service obligation. Once you join the Foreign Service, you're just like everybody else, though. It's not like you're treated special or looked at any differently. Honestly, uh, the uh, selection process for the Wrangell Fellows is extremely rigorous. Uh, you'll go in as an outstanding Foreign Service officer, really well prepared uh, to do a great job in the Foreign Service. Okay. Oh, how are we doing over there? Did you see the question? Oh, uh, well, if one does not pass the medical, uh, must the student pay back the scholarship? Uh, okay, that's a good question. Um, that would depend. Um, and again, I don't, I'm not the one that actually gets to make this final decision, so I'm going to give you my impression uh, of what the answer is, but I will uh, try to, but know that in the end, the State Department has the final say on that. If it's something in medical and you have disclosed it up front, as to what you know what the issue is or if it's something that in the medical we find that you didn't even know you had you know that really shouldn't uh, be an issue um, if it's something for some reason that you hid or that you you know you know that then there could be a repayment obligation uh, but generally as long as you're you know uh, very uh, honest in terms of your own medical condition and um, you know you um, and you follow up on what um, people, what the uh, doctors ask you to check, it should not be a problem. The other, the issue that can be a bigger issue is the security clearance. Uh, because again, if you didn't get your security clearance and we are all paying for your um, uh, school, you could be asked to um, pay some of that back. This year, hopefully it'll be less of an issue. Uh, because we um, have moved the application up, and so you'll be starting your security clearance in November, which gives us a longer time to uh, do the security clearance processing before you would actually start accepting any funding. Um, if you want later, I can talk a little bit more about the types of issues that come, come up in security clearances, because I think that's very important. Um, I will go on and talk a little bit about the application process, but I will come back and, and uh, take talk a little bit more about clearances towards the end. Okay, eligibility. You guys probably already know this now. U.S. citizenship, a cumulative GPA of at least 3.2, and readiness to enter grad school in the fall of 2017 for a two-year master's program at a U.S. institution. Now. This time, um, because it's early, probably uh, you may not have actually started applying for graduate school yet. That's fine. You just need to write down on your application where you plan to um, apply to graduate school. So that's what is of interest to us. And it does have to be a two-year program. So if you look at the way the application is written, so it will often ask you, when do you intend 
to graduate from your graduate program. It should probably say spring-summer 2019. If it's more than that, then it would not be, or less than that, it really would not be a two-year program. So that's what we're looking for there. Um, in terms of a GPA, again, we are strict because we have to be. Uh, no matter how wonderful you are, if you don't meet the 3.2, we can't send it forward to the uh, grad school. If you have questions about your own, you know, I know, uh, you know, there can be some issues with GPA. You can always contact us one on one, and we'll be glad to try to help you find, figure out your eligibility in that area. Okay, so these are the three th things you have to have to be able to uh, compete for the fellowship. Okay, selection process. We are going to have 30 fellowships for 2017, and we're very excited about that. We're going to look at, uh, in terms of making decisions, your academic background, your personal statement, your financial need, your letters of recommendation, community service, leadership, and we give a few points for honors and awards. Uh, so the panel first reads your application. Then they all get together. And this year, it's, uh, I think, October 25th. Um, that they're going to all get together. Um, they'll look it over, and with that, they'll pick 60 people. And we'll immediately contact you and let you know that you have been selected as a finalist. You see, it'll say October 26th on this. That's because we probably need a day to get our letters ready to invite you uh, to be a finalist. We'll let you know whether or not you're a finalist, too. We try to get uh, you know all of our information out without, within 24 hours of making any decision. If you're a finalist, we'll invite you to Washington, D.C. If you're not from this area, we will pay to have you fl flown in. We'll arrange it and have you flown in and put you in hotel for one night. Then you go through the interview process. This year, it'll be November 16th and 17th. You only have to be here one of those days. During that period, you'll do basically a 25-minute interview with our panel, and you'll do a one-hour writing exercise. If you are selected to be a Wrangell Fellow, um, you will, um, uh, again, if you are selected, then you'll know, you know, basically the, the next day, um, November 19th, 18th or 19th, uh, will be when we will let people know. Um, if you're selected as a finalist, uh, I will do another whole round of presentations for you on what it's like to actually interview and what you can expect from the day. Uh, we try to be really transparent in terms of what we're looking for uh, to try to help you. And if you haven't checked out our website, there's one part of it I think that's good for this stage, which is tips for preparing a competitive application. Hopefully you'll find that very useful in terms of telling uh, you what we're looking for in this round of the application process too. Okay, our application deadline this year is September 19th, 2016. Yes, this is early. It's about four months early than it has been in past years. Again, this allows us a little bit more time to do things like security clearances, uh, getting your uh, congressional internships. So we see this as a very positive development in the program. Your application components are all online, but basically they're a personal statement. Um, that's a 600-word statement, a 400-word financial needs statement, um, two letters of recommendation, one is from faculty and one is from community leader. When we say community leader, we're talking about somebody uh, that knows you as an emerging professional. So this could be somebody that you did an internship with, your internship supervisor. It could be somebody, maybe your boss at work. Maybe it's a faculty advisor to a student organization. But somebody that knows you kind of in a non-academic way that can talk about things like, you know, your work ethic, your organizational skills, your interpersonal skills, something that perhaps your, you know, professor wouldn't know. Uh, let's see. You need to have proof of U.S. citizenship. Uh, you know, at this point, you're just really uploading copies. And then if you're invited to uh, interview, we'll actually have you bring the originals with you then. Uh, you'll do the student aid report, too. The student aid report is uh, generated by the FAFSA. Um, let me see if I have this right. You'll be filling out now what's, on, what's available is the 2016-2017 FAFSA. You do that using 2015 uh, financial data. These things should be online now. You can go ahead and fill it out and send it in. Please note, though, it takes a few days after you fill out the FAFSA before you get the student aid report. So please take that into account so you're not doing it at the last moment. Um, if you received um, 
financial aid while you were in college, you know, please provide us some official document to show us what your financial aid was. So, you know, maybe you got a Pell Grant or maybe you had some other type of financial aid. We would just like to see what that was. So please upload that. GRE scores, GRE or GMAT scores this year are optional. We know because the um, deadline is earlier, not all of you will have taken your GREs or GMATs uh, uh, by then. Perfectly fine. If you haven't, then you don't have to put them in. If um, you know you have taken them and they look fabulous, you can put them in. You know, if you haven't, if you have taken it and you're not necessarily really eager for the panel to see their scores, you don't actually have to put them in. So anyway, this, it is optional. Uh, you do have to have transcripts, though, from all colleges or universities attended. Um, that's one's very important. So very often, um, that's what we have to go back to people on. Oh, you didn't, you know, put something in. If you got credit from an institution, you have to provide us with uh, the transcripts of that. Also, remember that you know that they can be student copies. They don't have to be official copies. We'll get the official copies for you later. But remember that the panel has to read them, and sometimes we'll get them where, you know, there'll be just like dozens of pages with one or two on each page. That can be kind of hard to read uh, for the panel members. So remember, you want your entire panel. I mean, you want your entire application to look good. So make sure your transcripts are, are easily read by our application. OK, final thing is tips for preparing uh, a competitive application. And again, this is online, uh, but just some basic things that I want to highlight for you. First one is please review the application requirements to ensure you're eligible and then prepare. What I mean by that is, one, if you're not eligible, you don't want to spend the time doing it. And being prepared means just making sure you can get your letters of recommendation on t done on time, uh, make sure that you can get your FAFSA done on time, make sure that you know a little bit about the Foreign Service, because that's really what you're applying for in this. And so you want to spend a little time looking at the Foreign Service website. It's www.careers.state.gov. So you know, make sure this is really what you want. Think through the options and then you can start your application. Um, one of the things that's extremely important is your statement of interest. So you'll have to tell us why you want to be a Foreign Service Officer and what do you bring. Um, please remember to talk about your motivations. Very often people are very comfortable talking about what they've done, but not so ta comfortable talking about really why. What is it about the Foreign Service that attracts you? And then again, um, things that you've done, and that can be your academic background, your experiences, maybe skills that you have. You don't have to repeat what you have in um, your application, you know, exactly what your job, you know, your job um, responsibilities were. We have that. Your job in this statement of interest is to bring it all together to help us understand, you know, kind of um, the narrative for why you want to be a Foreign Service Officer and why you would be qualified. So don't worry about being extremely um, uh, everything, you know, having every single detail in there, but do please worry about um, the fact that it really tells a story about you. Uh, if you've overcome any obstacles, we're also very interested in that. The next thing is you want to demonstrate academic ability and rigor in studies. Um, that basically, we're just looking at your transcript. It's not all about your GPA, just, we just want to see that you've taken a variety of different courses um, and that you've uh, pushed yourself academically. Uh, we don't have any specific major that we look for, but we do have, um, but we do like to see that again, you have uh, pushed yourself and they've taken a variety of classes. We usually like to see something in the quantitative area and at least an English class, maybe a policy class, maybe a foreign language. Although if you come in as uh, uh, with a foreign language, you may not. So again, we just like to see um, a full and rigorous um, uh, college application. Now, I don't want you to think though, that if you have a 3.9, um, you know, you'll always get it over someone that has a 3.2. That's not necessarily so. Uh, again, it really depends. Uh, but anyway, we're going to look at your uh, transcripts very seriously. Um, then let's see, obtaining strong letters of recommendation. Uh, again, go to people who know you and like you, which sounds very basic, but sometimes people will go to 
um, you know, kind of the big names. So let's say you did a congressional internship. You will go and ask the congressman to write you a letter of recommendation. And that's fine if you worked closely with the congressman. But if the congressman doesn't really know who, even who you are, you know, it might be better to work with the chief of staff who really does know your work uh, better. We want them to sound like they know you and that they're really enthusiastic about you. So we don't care if it's your supervisor. When it comes to, um, let's see, when it comes to, um, Picking uh, someone for your academic, please pick the person you've taken a couple classes with that likes you very much. We don't care if it's the chairman of the department or something else. Okay? Um, let's see. Demonstrate the need for financial assistance for graduate school. And I see we have a question about that. So, and I see we have another question about overseas internship, and I'll get back to that. But I will talk a little bit about financial uh, assistance for graduate school. So basically, the type of documents we're asking you to provide are a 400-word essay that tells the panel, why do you have financial need? And you can talk a little bit about your background, you know, your financial background, if, if uh, financial challenges was part or is part of your background. This is certainly something you want to talk about. And if there are, you know, ways that you want to tell us uh, about financial need. And honestly, we don't have a very specific uh, definition because it can really, there's a lot of manifestations. So maybe one person, you know, had to work their way through graduate school. Maybe another person will start at a community college to save money. Maybe you went to a, um, Oh, maybe you got a merit scholarship, but without that merit scholarship, you probably couldn't have gone to that school. Or maybe your parents and family helped you while you were an undergraduate, but they can't while you're a graduate. What, um, or maybe you have lots of debt. Any of these things could show financial need. So please uh, put them in. Um, the specific question we got was, do loans, federal subsidized, unsubsidized, and parent plus qualify as financial aid in relation to the need to obtain an official financial aid statement from your senior year? Okay. Anything um, that um, I'm trying to think. anything that comes directly from your school or through your school, you would see an official financial aid statement. There may be other types of um, loan information that doesn't go through your school. You can still provide us with that uh, information if you want, and it will it'll also be including it on your FAFSA form. Uh, so we'll be able to see it. So again, anything comes through your school will probably show up on official financial aid forum. If there are other types of loans you've taken out that wouldn't show up about that, you can certainly show us documentation or simply include it on your FAFSA, and we'll be able to see your level of indebtedness from there. You can also highlight that in your statement. So if you have $90,000 in debt, let's say, uh, educational debt. Personally, I would highlight that in my statement just so the panel can't meet it. Or again, if you had to work or whatever your issues are, not only put them but really highlight them for the panel. Think of it as you're sitting in front of them and they're asking you, wow, why should we give money to you? Uh, you know, why do you need the money? This is your chance to actually tell them. So uh, we do actually then ask you to answer some specific questions in the application about your financial position. Most of those questions come directly off the FAFSA. It saves the panel from having to you know, look at that very detailed document. Although, again, I look at it very carefully, by the way. Um, <laughs> but uh, there's a couple of questions that don't. And these sometimes uh, raise uh, issues, but let me explain. There's probably two or three questions that about your finance that are not anywhere else. One of them is, um, you know, what do your parents do for a living, and how much do they uh, make? Now, you may be an independent student. It may not matter. Maybe that your parents aren't going to help you pay. That's fine, and you can tell us that. However, you still have to answer the question. Okay? This will tell, I'm always interested, maybe somebody's a first-time college student, or maybe, I don't know, it's just one piece of data. It, does it, um, if your parents actually have funds and they're not giving them to you, does that mean that you can't get the fellowship? No, not at all. It's just one more piece of data that we have to learn a little bit about you. So please do answer that question. If you don't answer that question, we're going to come back and say you have to answer that question. So please go ahead and, and answer those questions. Um, so those are really what we need. 
Um, okay, I have a question on personal statement. Okay, the personal statement is 600 words, not 400, according to website. Can you please confirm? Okay, there are two types of person or two types of statements in the application. The first one is your personal statement, and that is 600 words. The second one is your financial needs statement, and that one is 400 words. So personal statement is, why do I want to join the Foreign Service, what do I bring, and who am I? Right? The second one is, why do I need funding for graduate school? And that's the 400 word essay. So there are two essays that you're going to write. Okay, I'm going to jump back to preparing a competitive application again and talk about some of the things I haven't talked about. One of them is including all your relevant extracurricular community or volunteer experiences and highlighting leadership roles. So we don't have a limit on how much you can say um, about that. So please tell us, um, uh, you know what, um, you know what you've done, and tell us a little bit about any leadership you've done in them. And so again, it could be student organizations, it could be community, it could be a variety of things. And by leadership, I don't mean just you know I was the vice president or president, but if you actually spearheaded the um, funding drive, or if you coordinated a special event, put that in. Good, strong words that show leadership and initiative are very useful uh, to us. And tell us how long you've been doing it. That's very helpful, too. Because, you know, we again, look at something differently. If you spent one Saturday working at Habitat for Humanity, that's great. But if you spent three years working for Habitat for Humanity and headed up the um, I don't know, meal production or something. That's a different level of involvement. And so we're, we're interested in knowing that. Um, the next one is list any relevant college or university or professional honors and awards. So if you've gotten anything you know, that you want us to know about, please tell us. Maybe it's a special scholarship that you got, or maybe, I don't know, whatever it is. You know, you're putting your best foot forward for our panel. Tell us what you've done. Um, and we're very interested in that. My final piece of advice is to proofread all areas of your application um, carefully and submit it on time. Now, proofreading is really important because by the time you finish this, honestly, you're not going to want to look at this again. And sometimes I think if if you've written something, after a while, it's really hard for you to see mistakes. So you know, ask a friend to read it. Ask you know somebody else to read it, and make sure. I can tell you many stories of people that have not done this. Um, you know, for example, somebody put in something where their name was spelled wrong. Well, it put, and it was very obvious that it was spelled wrong. And the, and the way our system works is to put your name all over the application. And so it was sort of like screaming out to the panel, you know, I have no, um, you know, I'm not conscious of details. And you don't want that. You want it to be good. So take the extra time, make sure every aspect of your application is good. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to answer some of the questions that have come up. The first one is, does the Rango program pick where you uh, do your overseas internship? Uh, it's a joint uh, endeavor to, to pick where you do your internship. So what it's going to be is you have some uh, requirements that you have to do in terms of where you can bid. You can't bid someplace dangerous, so if you want to go to Afghanistan, we probably won't send you as an intern. So you can't go anywhere dangerous, and you have to go someplace where the embassy will provide you housing. That said, most places are open to internships, and you're going to give us um, a list of where you most want. So you will actually say, in uh, the Bureau of Western Hemisphere, I'd like to go to Lima. Peru, I like to go to Buenos Aires, uh, Argentina, and Brasilia, Brazil. And so that's what we'll try. So with those things that you come up with, we'll work with the State Department to try to get you those internships. Uh, most people get one of their top choices, but sometimes you don't, and you have to be a little bit flexible. Honestly, the things that sometimes are the most fun and the best learning experiences in the Foreign Service are the things that are unexpected, that cause you to grow, uh, and um, I think that's good. Again, most people do get them, but every once in a while you'll find that you get something different, and those are, without a doubt, those are like the best experiences too. So yes, you have a lot to say in it, but you know, always remember that you have to stay somewhat flexible. Okay. Next question, are there fellows who have left the Foreign Service after they committed the initial five-year requirement? Um, so let's see, we have 
So first place, um, we have never had somebody who's joined the Foreign Service who hasn't committed or hasn't uh, finished their uh, requirements. So we've never had anybody leave early who's joined the Foreign Service. We have had a couple people that have left after that. Uh, we, 90, I think that's like 4% of everybody was joining the Foreign Service, so it's very small. It's about, I don't know, maybe about five people who've left after that. Um, and, you know, that usually had nothing to do with Foreign Service. Most times it had to do with a relationship that didn't necessarily work. So out of 230 something, I think we've maybe had five year, five people who've ever left after uh, they did their original commitment. And we've never had anybody uh, that has left before, uh, that has joined the Foreign Service that has left before they finish their commitment. Um, is there an average age of Wrangell Fellow? Are older applicants at any advantage or disadvantage? You know, I've never calculated that uh, as to what our average age is. Generally, our fellows are someplace between you know, 22 and, and 33, you know, um, uh, but that does not mean that they couldn't be older. Uh, we have no age limit on it. Um, and is there a benefit? Um, uh, no, not necessarily. So we take people that are both, we take people that are coming right out of uh, undergraduate, so seniors, and we take people that have been in the workforce, sometimes one year, maybe up to six or seven years. Any of those things are fine with us. Um, we find that we actually do, we tend to pick more people that have um, some work experience. Now that's because that is actually who's in our applicant pool. So we, a lot of people actually, before they uh, decide to go to graduate school and before they decide to commit uh, to something like the Foreign Service actually want some work experience. So, you know, um, very often uh, the majority of people who apply to the Wrangell program actually have uh, some work experience. That said, uh, every year uh, at least a, probably a quarter of those who get the fellowship are coming right out of undergraduate. So again, age does not uh, matter at all all to us, um, oh, up to a certain, I think if you were, I think it's like 52 or something might be a problem, above 52 because you have to be able, I think the Foreign Service has a certain period that you have to go in by because we have mandatory um, retirement at the age of 65 and anyway, but, uh, and I don't know exactly what that, and maybe that's some, probably about 55 would maybe be the top there, but again, other than that, no, we don't have any as long as you meet the uh, requirements. Now, one of the things I would say, do not worry about what somebody else has, has in their application. You know, put forward what you have and do it in the best possible way. So one of my own pet peeves about applications is I hate the sentence that starts, while I don't have blank, 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 I do bring da, da, da. Just take out the first part of that sentence. Why would anybody highlight what, where they think their weaknesses are. So sometimes I'll say, you know, while I don't have a lot of far, uh, international experience, I do bring, you know, strong leadership skills. So take out the, you know, while I don't have international experience, just saying, you know, I have really strong leadership skills and make your best case for who you are. Again, we look for many different things. There is not one standard profile that we're looking for in a Wrangell Fellow. I mean, we believe in diversity. Um, and each of you is gonna have something really um, special about you, and we want you to highlight that. Okay, here's the next question. As far as the mentorship component, are the fellows assigned specific mentors and how are they chosen? Great question. Mentorship is really important to us. So when you come for an interview, you're gonna fill out a form that asks you about your, men your interest in a mentor. So you're gonna tell us things like, um, uh, what uh, career track you're most interested in. You're gonna tell us what part of the world you're most interested in. You're gonna tell us what um, issues you're most interested in, and then you're gonna tell us anything else that might impact your um, interest in a mentor. So you could say, um, I'm interested in uh, Asia, I'm interested in uh, human rights, and uh, women's empowerment, and I'd uh, be interested in a um, female uh, mentor that has children. And so that's sort of how we'll try to, to find somebody. We actually um, pick the mentors uh, before you even get to Washington that first summer. And we always pick people who are in Washington, D.C. 
at least initially, so that you have a time to meet them face to face, and so you really get to work with them. So that's your formal mentor. And then you're going to find in the program that you have lots and lots of informal mentors. You're going to meet so many different foreign service officers. You're going to meet a lot of our fellows um, in the Wrangell program, and you will absolutely find people uh, kind of as informal mentors who really kind of um, you feel a real affinity for, and so we want you to follow up with them too. So uh, mentoring is very important. And then we hope as a, a program that we uh, try to mentor you too. So I spent 20 years in the Foreign Service, and I'm a retired Foreign Service officer. Lily has also uh, done tours in the Foreign Service. And so um, we're hoping that we'll be able to help with your mentorship too. Okay, let me see if I have anything. Yes. Oh, my question. These are just some of our fellows. So think if you have anything else. I'll tell you about, actually, you know, maybe I'll tell you about some of our fellows. Um, so if you look at our um, our fellows, one of them, uh, again, right next to the Wrangell, that's Tanisha Henry. She's off in Colombo, Sri Lanka, and is having an incredible experience. She is a political officer. Next to her, uh, Moises Mendoza and Amanda Zayden. They've just, uh, and again, next to them is David Gutierrez. Both are 2014 Wrangles who are just uh, joining the Foreign Service actually in September. Uh, Moses graduated from uh, Columbia University, uh, Amanda from Georgetown University, and uh, David uh, just graduated from the uh, University of California, Berkeley. So again, our fellows do their um, graduate programs all around the country. Below that is uh, in front of the United States of America sign, that's uh, Keeman Rowe. Keeman's from Texas, and uh, he was working uh, overseas at the um, during his internship. I believe it's the U.S. Food, what do you call it? The, the World Food Program. Uh, so that's him at the World Food Program. Uh, next to them would be uh, Khan Wynn, uh, Hamad Hamad, and Mercedes uh uh, Crosby, Crosby. Uh, this was them when they were graduating from the Fletcher School at uh, Tufts University. Next to that is uh, 2014 fellow Shauna um, Carter. So again, we're very proud of all of our fellows. Uh, the ones who are most senior are have moved up extremely quickly and are doing wonderful things in the Foreign Service. Okay. So I have another question here. Could we update the Wrangell Committee of an acceptance to graduate school if it is before we are notified about interviews? Yes, you can. Um, you, we would be happy if you wanted to interview, if you wanted to tell us, that would be fine. If you don't get, you know, it's not a problem if you don't have, we don't expect you to have no, to know where you're going to graduate school. But if you have been accepted, so let's say you're doing a deferment, certainly upload that information, or you can provide it to us afterwards, and we would be interested. Okay, next question. Would a fellow be able to defer for educational reasons other than Fulbright? At the moment, we only do educational uh, re um, uh, deferments for Fulbright. I'm not sure what the specific issue would be, but you can ask us. But for right now, that, that is what we're doing. We do allow humanitarian deferments. So, for example, if, um, I don't know, you got sick or someone in your family got very ill and you felt like you needed a little bit of time, that would be something that we would consider. Uh, let's see. Should we repeat our international volunteer internship experience in the highlights international section if we've already listed them in detail under the employment section? I think in that case what I would do is um, in the uh, highlights section just briefly mention them. Uh, you don't need to go into this kind of detail that you went into other uh, sections, but you know if you worked overseas and you talked about you know your job overseas, I would still put in the fact you know that you that uh, you worked overseas in the in that highlight section. Again, you don't have to put a lot in, but just to make sure they're very aware when they're thinking about the fact that you do have a lot of international experience, if that's one of the things um, that is of interest to you. Okay, how does the program work with students who are selected for an interview but are living overseas? That's a great question, and this happens every year. Uh, I would say every year, you know, last year of the 60 interviewees, I think we probably had 15 people that were overseas, so it's actually fairly common. So what happens is we will tell you as soon as possible, 
if uh, you're uh, selected for an interview. However, you are required to be here for the interview. I mean, our panel really believes that it disadvantages anyone not to be here. Uh, a Skype interview is not the same thing as getting to see you in person. So um, you, but we cannot pay for overseas um, travel. So generally what you do is you would be responsible for doing your overseas travel. Uh, then we ask you to, you know, very often what you'll do is you'll find the cheapest um, entry point into the United States, then we will pay your domestic travel. So, for example, let's say you were in Taiwan. You might find the cheapest flight into the U.S., which maybe is Los Angeles. So you'd pay that part, then we'd pay the part from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C., Washington, D.C., back to Los Angeles. So those are things um, that, uh, that's, that's how we would uh, treat it. And again, we stay in very close touch with you. Let's see. Uh, does fluency in a critical language to the State Department, such as Arabic or Mandarin, give fellowship applicants an additional advantage? Um, hmm, that's a good question. Um, it's one of the many things, as I told you, everybody has different things that are advantages to them. Certainly we love to see people that have difficult languages. Um, uh, do you get extra points for difficult languages? No, but can it be a very uh, useful part of your narrative? Absolutely. We do actually give, uh, uh, I think, one point for, uh, is a tiebreaker. So if two people were exactly the same and, you know, you had language, then that might be. But, you know, more than anything, it's just a way of showing your commitment to international affairs because they are such hard languages and because um, uh, you've been working very hard on them. That said, you know, we also love people who speak Spanish and French and, and anything else. So, um, again, tell your story the best that you can. Okay, here's another question. For the second summer internship overseas, is it required to do an internship uh, at a bilateral embassy? Or is it possible to do an internship at a U.S. mission to the U.N., NATO, or a consulate? Yes, you can do, we have had people that have done internships at U.S. missions. We have a couple people, you know, you, uh, one of the U.S. Um, U.N. missions in Vienna, Austria. We have somebody this year. We have somebody who, uh, uh, we have had people at our U.S. mission to NATO before. Uh, so, yes, you can absolutely work at a U.S. mission and definitely at a consulate. So we've had people that have worked at the consulate general in Rio. We've had people that have worked in the consulate at Casablanca. So all of those options are open to you. We have one question that's not appearing for some okay. reason. Is there any way to contact someone of the current one of the current fellows to ask them about their experience? Yes. Um, so we'd be very happy to give you the name of a fellow um, if you want to talk to them and ask them about their experiences. They're all they're always really uh, happy to talk about their experiences. Probably the best way to do that is just to you know uh, contact us and tell us you know kind of your interests and that way we can hopefully uh, put you together with somebody that shares some of your interests. So tell us what colleges, you know, maybe what graduate programs you're looking at. Is there an area of the world that you're particularly help us um, pick a Wrangell Fellow that you'd have something in common with? But no, we're very happy to um, put you in touch with one of our Wrangell Fellows. We really want you to come into this process feeling like you understand it as well as possible and that you're in the best possible place to put together a, a good application and uh, be ready for um, interviews. Any folks? Let me give it a moment. Um, well, we thank you for taking part in this today. Again, we're always willing to answer questions. Um, I'm biased because I run the program, but just because I'm biased doesn't mean that I'm not right. Honestly, this is a fabulous program. You're going to work with uh, the greatest group of fellows that you can imagine. I think it's really the most special part of our program is the people that participate into it. And you're going to feel so much um, support and investment from the State Department and from so many people that not only want you to you know, succeed as a Wrangell Fellow, but want you to be a fabulous Foreign Service Officer and, you know, and really become uh, our future leaders in foreign policy. Um, so I think you'll find that uh, the support that you get is uh, wonderful. The preparations that you get for the career um, is uh, uh, wonderful and um, that you'll be part of a group that is really special. Actually, oh, I was about to sign off, but I want to talk about one thing real quickly, and that is the um, 
the evalu not the evaluations, your clearances. I promised I would do a little bit more than that. So what are the, what can be a clearance problems? Sorry, I hate to end on this note, but um, you know, it's security clearances are probably the issue that are more security and suitability, which are pretty much uh, the same. The only difference is suitability is almost a level beyond um, uh, security clearances. So security, they want to make sure you're going to, you know, protect, um, you know, U.S. government secrets and act accordingly. Um, but suitability also looks at the fact that you actually are representing the United States overseas. Um, so, for example, let's say you are a embassy official and you're overseas, and um, I don't know, you decide to drive drunk and you uh, hit somebody or you endanger somebody. Well, the next morning, um, what's going to be in the newspaper is U.S. official endangers local population. So you're not only you know, doing something horrible for yourself, but you're actually you're embarrassing your entire country. Uh, we don't want this. And so we have very high standards of conduct. Um, the most common things that get people in trouble are use of illegal drugs. Uh, young people in trouble use of illegal drugs. It's not that you could never have done it uh, And again, it depends on you know when you did it what type of drugs you did and you know how often you did it things like that So there's there's no cut and fast rule But I will tell you that you know if you've done it in the past year I would wait a year before you apply uh, it can't be really recent I mean you, it's hard to say that uh, talk about indiscretions of youth when it was last week, right? Um, so please give yourself a time between we've done and now. Um, other things that can sometimes come up with things like academic dishonesty, uh, that's bad. Uh, financial uh, irresponsibility, and that doesn't mean that you have debt. Unfortunately, almost everybody has debt. Financial irresponsibility would be that you, know, that you had defaulted on you know, your student loans, you weren't trying to pay them back. Um, so anyway, those are the types of issues um, that would probably come up in uh, that. I'm trying to think of other things that could come up. Um, just something that shows that, you know, your conduct, you know, isn't the type that we'd like to see representing uh, the United States. So anyway, I hope this has been helpful to you. I have one more question here, which is, um, nation session in September be similar to this one? Yes, it will. I, prom I don't really have anything new to say. Um, so I was just trying to give everybody an opportunity to hear a little bit about the program. And again, uh, my phone number is 202-806-5909. Uh, my email address is pscroggs at howard.edu. Lily, you want to tell me yours? Sure. Mine is lily, L-I-L-Y, dot Lopez McGee, L-O-P-E-Z-M-C-G-E-E, -E, at howard.edu. And um, my phone number, I don't have memorized, I'll try, 202-806-5909. Two, I think is what it might be. Okay, I'll but you post can call, it online. We'll and you can it. also call the general line for and you can always ask for Wrangell Fellows too. And we'll actually both Lily and I will actually be doing some traveling over the next couple of weeks. Um, so maybe email is the best way to arrange a phone conversation if you want to have one. Okay. Thank you all for taking the time to listen to this. We're really excited that you're applying. And if you have any questions, please come back to us. Thank you so much.